Good afternoon, everyone. Merhaba. Welcome to our Global Perspectives on Race and Racism Speaker Series. My name is Dr. Jair J. Harrington, Assistant Professor in the Black Studies Department at UIC. I will serve as moderator for today's talk, Vestiges of Colonial Philosophy, Anti-Blackness, Liberalism, and Violence in Palestine by none other than Professor Tabitha Celeste Mustafa. Here's the rundown of today's schedule. So first, I will provide some background about the series. Second, I will introduce our speaker where they will share their presentation. And last, we will have an open Q&A where comments in the chat will be acknowledged and you can also raise your hand so that you can dialogue directly with our guest. And then we will close for the afternoon. Before we begin, I would like to offer some background about the series. With support from the programming committees in the departments of Latin American and Latino studies, sociology, global Asian studies, and gender and women's studies, the Department of Black Studies will host the Global Perspectives on Race and Racism speaker series for fall 2023. This interdisciplinary series features scholars with expertise across the world to address the global socio-historical, economic, and systemic effects of racism. These events provide multiple perspectives through which participants can explore the global dynamics of racism. We will see that the phenomena of race not only intersect with citizenship, belonging, and constructs of the nation state, they also commingle with class, gender, sexuality, and ability. This series will highlight race and racism from a variety of disciplinary perspectives and geographic contexts. Now I will introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Tabitha Celeste Mustafa, who is the Wharton Coalition for Equity and Opportunity Fellow at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. As an applied ethicist, Dr. Mustafa's research combines insights from philosophy, law, and Africana studies to explore what morality and justice demand of business firms in response to the perennial influence of injustices like colonialism, imperialism, and racism on people and the environment. Their research interests are heavily influenced by their lived experiences as a Black Palestinian, time as a co-founder of and organizer with the New Orleans Palestinian Solidarity Committee, and background as a social justice advocate working with civil society organizations, governments, and universities to address human rights and racial justice issues. They hold a PhD in ethics and legal studies from Wharton, UPenn, and serve as principal of Red Magnolia Consulting. Thank you very much for joining us today, Professor Mustafa. The floor is yours, and we look forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you, Jaira, and thanks everyone for being here today. Um, it's an honor to be invited. Um, very interesting timing and uh, certain circumstances. Um, I know, just go ahead and get started uh, with the presentation. Um, So um, you've already heard the title um, of today's uh, lecture, and um, I'll just jump right in, but I want to give you a brief kind of overview of things before we really jump in. Um, this is a loose, a loose overview. There are many more slides than um, are listed here. Um, the content that I most want to discuss and that I imagine that um, most of you will, will most want to um, discuss and um, have a dialogue about uh, will be the content at the end. Um, but I think it's really important for us to have a shared understanding before we move forward. Um, it'll give you a lot of context for my argument, but also for um, some of the 
recommendations that I make at the end. Um, and I think the most fruitful dialogue. Um, background about that, uh, Professor Harrington, um, you know, mentioned uh, some of my background, but I think education is really important, whether it's like a university education or we're talking about political education um, and movement spaces, it's integral to developing uh, not just the shared understanding, uh, but education is the foundation for building power. And so I think that's part of uh, what I want to get to at the end. Um, but one aim uh, for today is how to, to demonstrate how collective action for principled struggles uh, can move us closer to justice. Um, but I insist that understanding the philosophical and the ideological underpinnings of um, some of what we're seeing today unfolding um, is integral to dismantling uh, the systems and structures that oppress us, but also um, that are completely antithetical to equity and justice and uh, just basic humanity, the things that we most want to desire. Um, so just a little content warning, you're not going to see, um, you know, bodies or anything like that, but just depending on your background and who you are, the next slide uh, could be a, a bit trigger that out there um, before moving forward. Aside from that, obviously, uh, or maybe not obviously, but in the context of these kinds of discussions, uh, violence is, is going to come up. Um, you won't see a lot of images of it, but we'll definitely be discussing it. Um, so let's just jump right in. So this is the, the context, uh, part of the context for today's discussion. Um, when I agreed to do this, I had no idea that this specific uh, assault and uh, war on Palestinians and on the people of Gaza, but also across historic Palestine would be happening right now um, in this way. But um, part of what I want to suggest to you is that, is that this violence is inherent in this structure and it's um, always ongoing. It's just that we're seeing it on full display um, and perhaps being made more aware of the complicity um, of institutions like the media and um, universities and uh, the state. So just to keep that in mind, but right now, just a bit of context, I think many of you have it, but you know, there is mass murder and displacement ongoing, ethnic cleansing, a complete siege on Gaza, um, although they have been under siege for 16 years now. Um, we've seen genocidal rhetoric, but also I think it's pretty evident at this point, also genocidal acts, um, just as defined by um, international law, not just, you know, pulling things out of a hat. Um, we've also heard um, U.S. officials, commentators, the um, Israeli officials, government leaders refer to Palestinians um, as, you know, terrorists or barbarians, human animals, children of darkness, the list goes on, um, which are obviously immoral and problematic framings uh, for just entire populations of people. Um, but what I want to suggest to you today before we delve a little bit deeper is that liberal and uh, liberal moral and political philosophy kind of set the stage for this or the foundation for this physical violence and erasure that we're seeing um, and what we're everything that we're seeing being perpetrated in historic Palestine today. So as the title suggests, we're going to be talking a little bit about liberal philosophy here. The um, Enlightenment philosopher that I want to most focus on is Immanuel Kant. Um, Kant was an Enlightenment era philosopher. Um, people often look to him for inspiration regarding like liberal democracy, democratic ideals, things like this. But at the same time, Kant um, endorsed colonialism and slavery 
uh, for the majority of his career. There's a, a little bit of debate now if after 1795, he might have thought slavery was a bad idea. But I think, you know, if you look at the, the history um, of his scholarship, you can see pretty plainly um, what his intentions were. In his development of moral philosophy, which I'll say will um, kind of intersect with his political philosophy, um, you see the way these things um, can support one another. So here, just to kind of briefly make sure we're all on the same page, Kant, Kantian philosophy has three formulations of something called the categorical imperative. These are things um, that different ways of formulating uh, morality. So the first formulation is universability, uh, universalizability, um, and that is a maxim that you can, you should only act according to things that you can generalize, right? So if, if we're going to say that I deserve rights, then I should be able to say that you deserve rights as well. It can't be just for me. The second one, uh, second formulation is respectfulness. So it's that you act and you use your humanity um, in your own person, but also to treat others with the same kind of respect and regard at the same time in the same way. And the last formulation, communalism, is every rational being must act as though the maxim were always a part of lawmaking. I think this one is actually very important um, because the laws that you set, you want it to, uh, you, you wouldn't want a state, which we've seen states like this, but you wouldn't want a state where um, there are one set of laws for one group of people based on their race or ethnicity or gender or religion and a completely different set of laws um, based on something else. So this, this communalism formulation of Kant's categorical imperative kind of speaks to that. These are all moral bases, which um, I should just note are not necessarily legal bases that we use to formulate institutions, states, governments, but also in the way that we relate to one another. So Africana Phil, not a person. This is uh, just shorthand for Africana philosophy. Um, the, the Africana philosophy perspective, I would argue, and also um, another way that you might hear it phrased is critical philosophy of race. These are often kind of overlapping bodies of uh, scholars in academia, but folks like Bernard Boxel, we'll get into in a second, um, the late Charles Mills, sort of Africana philosophers, but also someone like Robert Bernasconi, um, who's more in the critical philosophy of race tradition. These folks would say that Kant uh, made um, whiteness a prerequisite for full personhood. Now, <laughs> what exactly does that mean? Um, essentially, what you start to see and what I hinted at before in, in much of Kant's work is that um, there are white folks, or in, in this case, we're talking about Europeans um, during the you know, 1700s, um, who are entitled to specific sets of um, rights and moral benefits uh, by virtue of being European. Um, I'll give you just a, a couple of um, examples of this um, in the next slide, but I just want you to keep that in mind. So I've kind of just spelled everything out here. Don't you know, feel like you have to read it, but one thing I want to note uh, just in getting into Bernard Boxel's kind of explanation of how we can view this um, inherent racism, um, dehumanization in Kant's philosophy and how it contributes to some of the things we see later in development of today's nation states. So the first thing that, that Boxel says is that only one of Kant's own philosophies could cause him to have these terrible racial views. Um, the terrible racial views, one thing I'm hinting at is, you know, so the last slide folks have already pointed to, there's something that's just not right. There's, he's con condoning things that you wouldn't otherwise condone if you were going to follow your own set of maxims that we just looked over, right? So the second thing is, um, Kant says, 
we can regard the history of hu the human species um, and at large as the completion of a hidden plan of nature to fully develop all its pre predispositions in humanity. So essentially what that means is um, this is teleological. Tele teleological meaning um, this is just nature. This is nature just kind of running its course. These are things that are meant to happen. They're going to happen. And, you know, maybe that doesn't sound so problematic, but then when you really get into things, what you see is um, something about the development of uh, unsocial sociability. So this is so that people will have a naturally kind of self-serving uh, predisposition. People are going to want to say, no, this is for me. Um, you might be willing to um, endorse or participate in violence just because that's just how things are set out to be. But also keep in mind that he's talking about Europeans, um, people of African descent, uh, people indigenous to uh, what we call the Americas today, um, from um, what some folks refer to as the Middle East, they'll say like the Levant and um, North Africa, um, just, just everywhere that is in Europe, basically. Um, these people are not included in what he's saying here in terms of the development of these predispositions. There's this one set of people, Europeans, who have this tendency and it will force the lawful order. Now, what is the lawful order? I think this is pretty evident in, in determining what Kant is saying here, that all races will be wiped out except for the white. I don't, people have defended this. There are different ways to interpret this. As far as I'm concerned, it seems pretty evident here that this is um, kind of genocidal language, um, talking about violence and that the natural end state of things will be that Europeans, white, whiteness, white people will prevail and necessarily for that to happen is this kind of selfishness and violence that will be perpetuated over time. Um, so Boxel's argument is essentially that Kant devised his racial argument that the negative things that he thinks about um, black people or people of African descent being uh, lazy, but also like useful for work or um, that certain, that people indigenous to the Americas um, are not suitable for certain things because they're not as good as the um, Africans who have been enslaved at working for uh, white people for no pay, things like this. Um, and so again, Boxel's theory is that in order to match these racist, abhorrently racist views that Kant had, it has to be genocidal. His teleological history has to be devised in this way. Otherwise things just don't make sense for Kant in his own mind, but also in, in following the logic along the way. So then came along another philosopher much later, hundreds of years later, named uh, Norman Bowie. Norman Bowie um, is a professor to emeritus, I want to say, at University of Minnesota. Um, Bowie was a philosopher and um, also a strategic man management scholar. So according to um, Bowie, he gets into, you know, different formulations of the categorical imperative, but he, he says that uh, formulation three, uh, communalism is the most important, important, and this is essentially that you know, businesses uh, will operate as a moral community of equal respect. And if we can um, believe in, in this version of capitalism, this Kantian version of capitalism, where uh, business, trade, transactions all work together to support this kind of cosmopolitan uh, worldview, this cosmopolitan vision of things, then it will engender certain outcomes. And those outcomes are pretty interesting. Um, and then the question becomes, for whom? Who, who are the folks who are going to benefit from this, this communalism or from this cosmopolitan worldview if what Kant himself has said is true, that everyone else will be wiped out. 
who who's trading here and what does that mean? So I'd like to uh, to get a little bit deeper into what Bowie's saying. He says everything will be rainbows and sunshine, right? There'll be the if we follow this cosmopolitan, this communal Kantian worldview, there's going to be the end of warfare and identity-based conflict. There's going to be the end of um, there'll be more capitalism and there'll be the end of violence in conflict areas because of increased trade. Okay. And the example he gives here is that there is going to be increased business and trade between Israel, Jordan, and Palestine. And that this is one example we can see um, where, where peace will come about. Now, again, this was written, you know, over 20 years ago, but, you know, things were not all rosy at that time either. There was a lot of violence in the region that stemmed from, I would argue, this initial settler colonialist state being founded on indigenous people's land by virtue of, um, you know, other European nation states giving people rights to things that they did not own. So here, let's test out Bowie's theory. Here you can see this map is not up to date. It is actually much worse now um, in terms of, of land loss. But what we've seen is that um, trade did actually increase between nations in the Levant. So between Jordan, um, Palestine, and Israel, trade increased dramatically over the past 20 years, but also you can look at it like more expansively over the past um, 60 years as well. Um, at the same time, we can see that Israel was expanding its violent settler colonization of Palestine, that in these areas that you see on the map, the, the areas that Israel initially claimed um, title to as their own land based on some kind of, we'll say religious fallacy. Um, and there's evidence of this, right? This is um, written in the memoirs of the people who founded the nation state of Israel that this is actually um, not a religious, um, area that we're necessarily entitled to by virtue of our heritage. Um, what we're talking about is predominantly Ashkenazi um, Jewish folks who are founding this nation state, even interested in doing this before um, the Holocaust and, and using this as a tool, using the genocide of a people as a tool and a way to expand a settler colonial regime, which I think is an important way to, to think about this issue. Um, they actually considered other places, including Uganda, places in South America, right? So it, it wasn't that this was necessarily going to be the place um, to, to declare a Jewish homeland, predominantly for um, European and Ashkenazi Jews. Um, but this is the one where they felt like they had the best story. Um, so lastly, what we can see here is some compatibility between Kantian theory, what Kant says will happen about this violence um, where all races will be wiped out. So in the, in the small context of this, this one area of historic Palestine, we, we see that to be true is that there is colonialism, there is um, imperialism at play, there is genocide at play and ethnic cleansing. And these, things um, are, are things that Kant pointed to both in his moral and political philosophy, but we see them today in Israeli policy and practice. So some of the things that um, the, the areas where we see theory meeting practice in Israel um, is in physical erasure. So leading up to the founding of the state of Israel, um, and Plan Dalit. Um, this was a, a plan by the Zionist movement for the Nakba to, to um, participate in ethnic cleansing, to orchestrate a, a specific plan to carry out ethnic cleansing systematically that resulted in the Nakba or an expulsion of some say between um, 750,000 
it's upwards of a million Palestinians, um, the destruction of over 500 villages, the execution of at least 31 massacres and 31 distinct massacres, and the disposition dispossession of 11 urban areas from its native inhabitants. Um, so this is physical erasure. In terms of racism, we'll see that um, when Eastern European Jewish settlers moved to Palestine, their attitudes, this is a quote from uh, Masala, um, their attitudes toward the indigenous uh, Palestinian population were the attitudes um, that, that were characteristic of European colonizers. So um, viewing Palestinians as inferior or uncivilized. And this was part of the, the rationalization or um, supposed justification for this plan that they were carrying out of ethnic cleansing and colonialism. And then of course, we've seen this more recently, um, not, you know, not in today's uh, comments, but just um, earlier this year, Benjamin Netanyahu was saying that the Jewish people have an exclusive and unquestionable right to all of the areas of the land of Israel. And recently in the map that he showed up to the UN with, Israel was not just the areas that you saw on the last map, but Israel um, included all of Palestine. It also included, included part of Egypt and part of uh, Syria and Lebanon as well. So it's just thinking about the land of Israel as an expansion of the settler colonialism. And I want you to continue to think about this as an ongoing process, as something that is not yet completed in the way that Kant says this will be ongoing until everyone is wiped out. So I want to suggest that this is um, inherent to um, Israeli colonialism, but inherent to um, colonial philosophy and um, liberal philosophy that we use every day to kind of uh, justify and support our ideas about um, liberalism and democracies and capitalism all at the same time. And then of course, um, another area where we see this is in terms of miscegenation. Um, so race mixing, just different ways of saying it, but the Israeli state straightforwardly uh, opposes intergroup relations. So there are different laws in place to keep people, um, not just um, Israelis and Palestinians um, or um, Palestinians of different religions, so Christians, Jews, um, or Muslims from um, kind of supporting one another or um, being together because there's a threat in that as well, right? Collective power. Um, but specifically to, to keep people um, from one another. So um, there are instances where Palestinians who uh, may have a Jerusalem ID in East Jerusalem and be entitled to a specific set of rights um, cannot go and marry someone um, from the West Bank um, and expect that that person will be able to come and live with them. So things like that. These are um, things that are seen as challenges to the state of Israel. So um, recently in a, uh, an article um, discussing Israel's family reunification law, um, one of the Israeli officials said that uh, the, we have, for quote demographic reasons and to avert a quote creeping right of return which of course these are things that um for anyone who studies international law will send up your red flags as something that um, people are actually entitled to we'll get into that a bit later but um there are certain rights to which folks are entitled under international law in terms of a nation state that is under occupation. Um, and these are all being violated here. And I'm just giving you just briefly three categories where we can see this kind of play out. Um, but these are things that are central to the founding and central um, in terms of um, how the nation state goes about 
um, colonialism and the philosophical underpinnings. And I'm not saying that, you know, um, Netanyahu is sitting around um, with other Israeli officials and they're reading Kantian philosophy, but just that um, when these ideals were first coming about, they were central to um, colonialism and imperialism as it was practiced, and that we see these things kind of repeating themselves over time in history over you know the last couple centuries. So in terms of the you know a bit of a reality check, um, you know Israel does embody Kant's teleological conclusion. Um, there is um, ethnic cleansing and I you know would argue genocide. Um, ongoing, um, and that Bowie is both right and wrong here. Um, he's right in terms of um, increased trade. Um, he's wrong in terms of it bringing about peace, and I think um, it's a it's illogical and a kind of rational flaw to think um, that capitalism, which some of us know is inherently violent, can just bring about peace by virtue of um, capital and dispossession. Um, he, another way that he's right is that through this uh, dispossession and um, annexation and um, co-opting of things that do not belong to people, um, certain groups of people are able to use that. I think this is, you know, one way to, to think about capitalism. It's like using um, other people's resources to bolster yourself. Um, so in the state of Israel, we can think about it in this way um, as using Palestinian land and Palestinian people and resources and culture, um, you know, even as things like in the image, the kafia or um, hummus or things like that um, to say like, this is ours and uh, this gives us the right to do certain things. Um, but when you actually look at things historically and in context, um, you see that that's not uh, not only inaccurate, but it's just an excuse um, to carry out with mass atrocities, the same ones that you see today in Palestine um, and that follow logically from Kantian philosophy, but other liberal philosophers, this could have, you know, just as easily been about John Locke, um, but um, moral and political theoretical foundations of the colonial state are not things that are um, that we can just do away with because people tend not to think of what is happening today in different countries, including this one, um, as settler colonialism, but that are in fact um, in practice and informing what is happening. So a couple of things that I um, want to suggest here. Um, to argue that there is an underclass necessary for liberal democracy. So um, this is in a European capitalist colonial vision. And this underclass um, in the context of Israel and Palestine, here will be Palestinians. This is Palestinians of all races and religions, everyone from Afro-Palestinians to um, Colombian Palestinians and folks throughout the diaspora, it's necessary to kind of create a certain vision of people um, that allows them to be dehumanized, that allows them to fill both um, an ideological position, but also a physical position of inferiority. So in this way, I'll say that there are hierarchies within hierarchies. And what I mean by this is that um, while there are um, different groupings according to religion and race of Palestinians here, I'm gonna focus a bit on Afro-Palestinians um, and that the black bodies within that land are experiencing um, additional forms of oppression, right? Um, in terms of colorism, um, sometimes in terms of religion, but also in terms of citizenship status. Um, and I think it's really easy to just point to Afro-Palestinians, but just I just wanna maybe slightly divert our attention to also recognize that this happens to um, black folks in Israel as well, that because this is a European 
uh, Jewish nationalist state, that they too are kind of lower down on this hierarchy. They might in some cases be, we'll say higher up than Palestinians, they have more access than Palestinians um, and Palestinians of African descent, um, but they're still never going to realize the same access and availability um, and rights as um, the European um, folks in Israel. So here I'm thinking uh, predominantly about Ethiopian Jews, but this of course will impact a, a wide range of African descendant um, Jews, Sephardic Jews um, in the state of Israel who are subject to um, both, uh, we'll say imprisonment at times, um, the same way that we see in the US um, being kind of herded into facilities, um, being sterilized, um, being sprayed um, with uh, DDT and different pesticides to rid them of their Africanness. So I just, um, obviously it's, it's not the central focus of this, but I just wanna be careful to remember that um, kind of in a pan-African vision that um, blackness is criminalized regardless of um, what additional privileges you may get by virtue of your um, religion in this case. Um, the other thing to think about in terms of um, hierarchies within hierarchies will be um, anti-Blackness um, in um, Arab communities. And here, just to note that there are just certain words um, that are, that when translated, translates something like uh, slave. And those kinds of words at times may be used but are not necessarily the dominant thinking um, in terms of um, who's Palestinian and who's not Palestinian. Um, Afro-Palestinians um, do uh, share language, um, do share um, you know, most aspects of their identity with other Palestinians on the land. Um, but one thing I'll say is that we could characterize the areas where people um, I wouldn't even say are forced into, but the areas where people predominantly reside or in certain areas, people are kind of clustered together in um, East Jerusalem or clustered together in Jericho or clustered together in parts of Gaza. So um, I just wanna keep that in mind is that sometimes it can be um, a form of oppression to kind of herd people into ghettos, but sometimes it is also a source of power for people, a source of community, being able to, um, to build with people who have a shared identity. Um, another thing I guess that we, has recently come about is kind of combining um, African dance with Debka historic uh, kind of Le uh, Levantine dance. Um, but, you know, it's been a way to kind of build community and build power, but at the same time, um, within the Palestinian state, we see some of these colonial uh, remnants kind of influencing the way that people interact with one another and having concerns about um, marrying people who are African descendant, uh, descended Palestinians and things like that. It's not that it's, um, outlawed or completely um, endorsed by most people, but just that to keep in mind that like in every country, there are gonna be some people who are racist or who are more susceptible to, we'll say colonial ideologies and anti-blackness. Um, but in this way, I would say that black Palestinians kind of deal with a triple oppression. And uh, what I mean by that is that you would have, you know, European, uh, Jews or European Israelis at the top. And then after them, you might have um, the black or uh, non-European um, Israelis. And then below them, you might have um, Palestinians who are not African descendant. And then so these are the three forms, uh, kind of triple oppression. And then you might have Afro-Palestinians. I wouldn't say that's a universal um, thinking. I, I think um, most commonly people say and Palestinians are Palestinians regardless of where you are in the world or um, what ancestry you have. Um, I think the traditional way to think about 
uh, Palestinian identity um, does not take stock of uh, race or religion. Um, and that's something that's been colonially imposed as a way to divide people. So here, I just wanna um, briefly, um, we'll you know, wrap up soon and get to the questions, but just share a little story with you and um, give you some context for how to think about uh, blackness in Israel and Palestine. So uh, my, my late father and I took a trip. Um, we were trying to get into Palestine to go visit my siblings. Um, I had been before, my dad uh, had no citizenship. So he, for the majority of my life could go nowhere um, because he didn't have a passport, he didn't have citizenship. Um, the US will issue a, a travel document to people to return to uh, countries uh, where they might have, you know, they might be refugees or things like that. So there's something you can get to get on a plane. We made it to Jordan. Um, we tried several checkpoints. Eventually, uh, we made it to this last checkpoint that you see here. And we get in the car, we're trying to cross the border. And the um, IDF soldier who comes up to our car, this is the Israeli Defense Force, um, the, the woman who's manning the checkpoint, my dad looks at her and she says, he says, oh, you're black. My 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 daughter's mother is black. You're black. We're you're we're all black together here. Like, and she, she looks and says, "Oh no no no, I'm no not I'm not black. I'm Israeli. I'm Israeli and I'm Jewish." And I was like, "Okay, well, yeah, I didn't think that was gonna work, but he was trying to build some sort of solidarity here. I figured at this point it's worth a try. So this is our last chance, the last checkpoint, our last hope." Of, of making it across the border. And eventually we make it inside of the checkpoints and they have to check your car first and things like that to make sure you don't have you know, things they think you might have uh, just by virtue of being Palestinian. Um, get inside, they wanna check all our belongings, um, you know, start going through the suitcases, run it through the scanner, they say, oh, actually, we're going to need to strip search you. It's like, based on what? I haven't set off any metal detector. They were like, well, you know, you're a suspicious person. So I endure that. I come back out. I'm waiting. I think at this point, they probably thought, oh, your father's not a threat. He's in, you know, he's in his 70s. He has a cane, you know, like, what is he going to do? They offer him some coffee. So just thinking about the way that, like, gender is also at play in this as well. Um, and he, and eventually they get to the point where we know they're not going to let us through. They all but said that. But they open all of the suitcases and every single zipper in the suitcase and every single pouch with everything in it and just empty it all out and just spread it across the conveyor belt and the floor. And they're like, and now you pick it up. And they're laughing. This is just a, at this point, pretty clear. This is an effort at dehumanization um, and just um, an immoral kind of power play. And then this woman who we had seen before, who said that she wasn't black, she wants to come over and she, she sees the, the European um, Israelis kind of gathered together, kind of laughing, look at what we're making the Palestinians do, this is so funny. She comes over and she just gives me this, this look, this knowing look like, oh, okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe there is something similar here. She starts to help me pick up my things and put them back in the suitcase. I was touched because at some point I could see the other soldiers and whatnot kind of snickering. And at some point they started yelling uh, kind of slurs at her, what are you doing? Uh, things like that. And I think in that moment, she realized that we had that shared uh, blackness that shared identity and it was a point that I you know I, I don't know what happened to her after that but I think she realized um, 
that we had a shared struggle and that in this way, she was able to kind of humanize Palestinians overall. She was nice to my dad after that, right? Because of this one moment that we shared. And I think that's just, um, for me, it's a story that I look back on and I think, I wonder where that person is now because I can see the, the kind of light bulb go off in her head that she realized what she had be, been complicit in. And she realized that she too was facing a sort of oppression and that in some way she might be perpetrating some of those same harms against someone else based on nothing, based on ideology and rhetoric. Um, so lastly, um, I just want us to think about the power of solidarity and repair because I think that's part of what, what that story brings up for me. Um, we saw the power of solidarity um, in the Ferguson uprising where Palestinians were tweeting um, to black folks saying, hey, this is how you deal with this tear gas. It's literally the exact same tear gas that we deal with um, that is, you know, is produced by the US or produced by Israel um, and used as a tool of oppression, not, against, not just against black folks, in the US, but also against Palestinians um, of all races in Palestine. And so it was a, a, a moment of kind of building power as well. We've also seen this kind of solidarity through tactics and the way that they're employed and used in the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, also known as BDS. Um, I think people may have heard recently a lot of, um, I'll, I'll just call it rhetoric about um, BDS being anti-Semitic, even though it is not opposed to Jewish people, it is opposed to the Israeli state, um, which has, you know, people of other religions, but it is a Jewish supremacist, I would say white Jewish supremacist state. Um, but that the BDS movement is actually uh, based upon some of the relationships that were built during the civil rights era. And it is an ode to um, the, the boycotts and movements um, of that era and is taking inspiration from that and employing it in a current context, but in a global way. And it, um, it's actually a threat to the nation state, right? Because if you have um, this kind of global solidarity and power and people um, willing to take collective action, engage in the struggle together, that's when you build real power and when you can dismantle things. And I think that's probably one reason that the movement for Black Lives um, has gotten pushback about putting uh, Palestinian human rights as uh, a central aspect of their platform. But again, I would suggest that this is just another area of solidarity. And then another um, thing to think about just in terms of connections and um, the connection between solidarity and repair I think when most often when we think about um, reparations, we're thinking about it in the US context um, for uh, giving reparations to African descendant people for the harms of slavery, um, or in some contexts is formulated as ongoing harms um, against black people and the subordinated status, um, different ways of thinking about it. But I think that it's important to keep in mind that um, reparations are owed to other people. You know, reparations were paid to people who had, who had owned people following the Civil War, right? Reparations were uh, paid to um, the survivors of the Holocaust. And here I would argue that reparations are owed to Palestinians, I mean, to Black people in the US, but reparations are owed to Palestinians as well. Um, and that cessation alone is not enough. Um, a ceasefire in, in current context is not enough because what happens after that, people still have to rebuild. And the US has, um, the UN has five requirements um, for official reparations just in the kind of like international law context. So one is cessation um, and guarantees of non-repetition. I think we've seen cessation before, um, maybe of one specific kind of harm, right? Um, in 2014 or 2018 or 2020, um, but then you see it happen again. So you need guarantees of non-repetition. Also uh, restitution and repatriation. So um, people being able to return to their homeland, uh, people being 
return their stolen land or their houses, their houses that they still have keys to um, from, you know, 1948, things like that. Um, rest, uh, restitution, repatriation, compensation is also important. So um, often when people mention reparations, that's the way we think about it. Um, but also satisfaction, um, satisfaction meaning just like an apology. Hey, this was wrong and we're sorry about it. Um, and lastly, rehabilitation. So rehabilitation to the status that you were at prior to the harm. This will be very difficult, but I do think it's um, worth an attempt just in terms of what is morally required of people. So again, this could, um, and I suggest it should, entail the right of return, land, self-determination, and statehood. I'm not necessarily advocating for two-state solution here. I think that's probably not feasible at this point. Um, but just that people have a right to determine, have a right to use their agency toward um, a shared goal. Um, and then lastly, I would say that there are specific implications for Afro-Palestinians. So one would be um, through this um, kind of uh, rebuilding process, this uh, de decolonization process, um, one would be liberation from this triple oppression, liberation from this uh, colonial ideology, a need to ensure equitable repairs so that repair is distributed um, to all Palestinians in a way that um, responds to the specific nature of the harm because you know people may all be experiencing a harm, but it's important to recognize that it doesn't always show up in the exact same way. And uh, lastly, a commitment to dismantle anti-Blackness um, in the creation of these new institutions um, that are meant to be equitable um, and to um, support the rights of all Palestinians. So uh, thank you and shukran. And I, I know I spent a while, but I want you to have the, the context uh, so for this discussion and I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, thank you. Shukran, Professor Mustafa. Um, let us thank you so much for this um, wonderful presentation. Very insightful. Um, we're definitely informed to have a wonderful discussion. So now we'll open up the floor to have some um, questions, comments. Please feel free to drop those in the chat as well so we can engage directly with our scholars. Well, maybe to lead us off, um, for those who may be interested in the fields of philosophy or theory, um, this was a very, very wonderful applied um, presentation that you made to us. And it made me think about the kind of general gamut of liberal philosophers and the kind of social contract that also is implied within some of the discussion that you made, the kind of commitments that we implicitly have to one another um, within a state. But you know, um, you mentioned some Africana philosophers like Charles Mills with his racial contract, thinking about how it is that typically these sorts of engagements were written as raceless while within this Enlightenment era of uh, European expansion, of colonialism, of imperialism. Um, throughout the global south, um, that was indeed not the case. So I just wanted to delve a little bit more deeply into thinking about um, decolonization. And you mentioned some suggestions at the end um, for ways forward that would make material the kind of repair that's necessary after so much damage, after so many generations of destruction. Um, would you imagine some kind of um, kind of agreements that are necessary? Um, that would would need to that would look like that of a contract um, for the future of um, 
a safe Palestine um, that acknowledges these, these wrongs. Um, so what would you imagine that looking like? Thank you uh, for that question. I am gonna do a, a, a typical thing and just say that I am not the person to answer that. I think it's, uh, I think it's something that um, will have to be decided collectively. And I think that um, you know, Palestinians in Palestine, but also across the diaspora have to um, work together to think about what those what those, um, what the contracts might entail. Um, I think just in terms of orientation, um, what it might entail are, are things that most closely resemble, um, you know, agency and justice and um, recognition of humanity, just like at a base level. Um, but I think that it's likely to be so much more expansive than that. Um, but I just think that as things currently stand in a way that the, you know, the contract is written, there are certain groups of people who we might think uh, the literature suggests uh, don't matter, which of course is untrue, but just um, I think it's going to be really complex and I don't think that I alone am the person to, to answer that, but yeah, thank you. Just a little bit of an intellectual exercise and curiosity of what some of those boundaries might entail or what might be included. So thank you um, for that. Um, any other questions or comments here? Jordan, yes. Okay, so I think what really stood out to me is something that I brought up in our BLST 207 class. And I think that there's a, a narrative that exists among Black people that we shouldn't really have an opinion on Israel and Palestine because this doesn't really have anything to do with us. But it very much does because, you know, the African diaspora exists out in Palestine and just beyond the fact that it's morally wrong that you know people's lives are being taken and homes are being taken but you know there is a, there's been a lot of solidarity between black people and Palestinians and just the knowledge that that the solidarity exists and that you know there's a part of the African diaspora out there is really important and I think that's something that doesn't get brought up a lot and why this is so important to all of us and why I, I personally taken a bit of interest in this recently. Thank you for sharing, Jordan. Yes, Carmen. Um, I think that um, a major issue with the entire like war that is happening is that a lot of the um, things portrayed in like the Western media are very pro-Israel because that's where like all of our tax dollars are going. So they want like the people to understand, to, to see it from their perspective and they're not truly educating people of what's actually happening. And it's really disheartening to see that because um, it just feels like a lot of people don't even understand what's happening, um, at least just in the United States from like, even just what I've seen on like social media, a lot of people just don't even know what they're talking about and they're not even putting in the effort to learn about it. And our education system has historically kind of failed us in educating us about colonialism. And like, even if you look at the way that we've we've talked about this in this class too of how like in elementary school we used to learn we used to like dress up 
as the pilgrims and like it was so pro-Columbus and pro-colonizer and um, that kind of narrative has just existed for so long that a lot of people are just completely like miseducated about it and I think that's why spreading awareness and like everybody talking about it from every different group um, like raising awareness of it can like allow that collective effort to happen and just make it so that if we all truly know what's happening we would all be against it and like just stopping the spread of the propaganda as much as we can is the only thing that we can do right now thank you carmen for your comments would you like to expand a little bit tabitha on the um media's role in perhaps some of the narratives that are um, more dominant, particularly in um, Western media. Um, would you like to comment a little bit on that? Sure. Um, yeah, I think that's an important point. Um, you know, the media has a role, um, education systems have a role, and I think that um, it's a mistake to think that this is um, accidental, that, um, I mean, I think it's been long known since the miseducation of the Negro, but just like that there is an intentional effort um, to provide a specific kind of uh, narrative. And I think we've seen this recently um, with the critical race theory um, legislation being passed to, you know, to stop people from learning about it, which, you know, something that tends not to happen until you're in law school um, where you get that kind of education to begin with, but just um, there is a concerted effort to um, stop people from learning history um, because that is, that is a way that people can actually have context for what's going on. Um, there's a concerted effort to keep that kind of information out of the media as well. Um, I know that folks like Nora Erekat and uh, Omar Badr, Omar Shakir, um, have all had their appearance, media appearances pulled um, over the course of the past couple of weeks. Um, people have had difficulty getting op-eds uh, published um, because editors just are not willing to publish um, perspectives that contextualize things or that um, have a, a certain narrative which is um, supportive to human rights or to, to Palestinian resistance. Um, they, I would say that it's gone so far as um, even like in the Atlantic, uh, they haven't been publishing uh, Palestinian voices. I think in the 55 articles that they published about um, Israel and Palestine in the past um, two or three weeks, um, They've only published one article that was written by a Palestinian in Gaza. And it's more of like a personal narrative than like here is context for everything that is going on. Um, and it's not a mistake. Um, a memo was released recently that um, had uh, media executives saying um, to their staff that um, you need to publish things with a pro-Israel bit, it's like just very explicit. Um, and these things, of course, are um, antithetical to uh, democratic ideals, but also to free speech. Um, and we, you know, seen universities crack down on that. But I would argue that the media is playing a central role in it, and it's really important to um, get your media from elsewhere um, if you. You know, these are the same institutions that for a long time have, you know, published or, or framed uh, Black people in a specific light. Um, it didn't just start, you know, like a couple of weeks ago, it's an ongoing problem. I think emergence of new media is important, but also, um, you know, check out Al Jazeera. Um, and we know that people who are doing, you know, real journalism, who are, are doing principled journalism, are actually um, being targeted. Um, you may have seen recently that um, Blinken uh, went uh, to Qatar and said to them, hey, you need to tell Al Jazeera to tone it down a bit. Um, it's it's seeming too, too supportive of Palestinian human rights. 
Um, they, but they're just publishing the facts. They have reporters on the ground, right? They're, um, and so the day after that, yesterday, um, the lead journalist um, in Gaza, his family was targeted and murdered. So these things are not by accident, they're by design. And um, even media refuses to be complicit in war crimes and um, atrocities and in crimes against humanity. They too were targeted. So I, I often caution people to remember that, um, yes, you, you may be at risk for speaking out on whatever platform, um, but you know, there are people dying and there are lives at stake. There's morals at stake, but there, you know, there's like just the soul of humanity is also at stake. Um, and you just have to ask yourself, you know, what is most important to you at this time? Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, to that point, um, someone has asked, how can we be in solidarity with Palestinians and those who speak up for Palestine, especially in spaces where there's retribution? academia, for example. There are a couple of ways. I mean, there are many ways, but I'll, I'll just offer a few thoughts here. Um, if you have a Palestinian friend or a colleague, like right now is just a very difficult time. It's difficult to, you know, wake up every day and wonder if, members of your family are alive or um, wonder if anyone cares that, you know, um, the entirety of people of your ethnicity or um, maybe, or nationality may be wiped from the face of the earth. Um, so yeah, just, I think the most basic and kind of human thing to do is just check on people. But um, the other thing I, I would say um, in spaces where there is retribution, and I think I, I kind of pointed to this earlier um, in places like academia or um, you know certain career paths like um, in the State Department, for example. You can use your position to speak out in support of um, a ceasefire or of um, Palestinian human rights or um, ending atrocities. Um, I don't think that that's a lot to to do or to um, to ask of people. Um, in fact, I think it's a really simple task. But if you do face retribution for that, um, it's likely. That, I mean, this is I'm not giving like legal advice here, but I think it's likely that probably one of your rights is be is being violated if you're speaking out um, and you're being fired for that. Like you you have a right to free speech. Um, and so I think it's just also important to remember what is at stake. Um, you can find another job. Um, people cannot find another child, find another mom, find another grandpa or dad um, or neighborhood. Um, you know, there are certain things um, in life that are irreplaceable and you have to be willing to um, put your status or your body um, on the line for those things sometimes. And I think that this is one of those times. Thank you so much. And um, at, in the interest of time, we'll just um, close here. Um, and I just wanted to um, let everybody uh, give a warm thank you Shukran to our Professor Mustafa, who is here with us today. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. And I just wanted to also mention before we close that this is a moment for remembrance. So six-year-old Wadia Al-Fayumi, a Palestinian boy, was recently violently attacked and stabbed to death by a 71-year-old landlord in Plainfield, Illinois. So in the Chicago area where many of us are. His mother also suffered critical injuries from this attack. And it was said that due to this landlord's exposure to the media's reports on Hamas, he believed that all Muslims must be eradicated. And we cannot identify causal links so easily, but the way in which our public spaces and institutions condemn intolerance and hatred 
while rewarding silence and punishing dissent in the face of Palestinian genocide is unacceptable. May this space today allow us to collectively mourn the loss of life in the present conflict in Gaza and collectively dream for safer, more secure futures for all who face state violence, displacement, and repression around the world and right here in the United States. Let us not forget the impact of conflict and power struggles for the people of Sudan, Haiti, Burkina Faso, Niger, Mali, and others who just want to live their lives. So thank you so much, Professor Mustafa, for your insights. We are so honored to have you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, shukran. And also, um, please join us next Thursday at 12.30 p.m. for guest lecturer, Dr. Brittany Ray Crowell, who will help us think about migrants around the world with the talk, When Water is Safer Than Land, Warsan Shire's Home as a Work of Witness. Thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon. Goodbye.